post 100K, that's when things start to heat up and it starts to accelerate. I think 2025 is going to be the year of the Omega candle and the year of 1 million Bitcoin. Does Bitcoin prolong the life of the dollar or does it kill it? We are approaching the 100K for Bitcoin. Right now, we saw like a slight pullback from the all time high, but I'm pretty sure that we're gonna get back there. By the time we will publish the video, probably we might have already reached the 100K. So, what do you think is the significance of this benchmark for Bitcoin? Yeah, so 100,000 or 0.1M, it's sort of a psychological barrier much in the same way as uh, 10,000 was a barrier and 1,000 was a barrier and 100 was a barrier. So I think once we pass 100,000, it's just smooth sailing up to 1 million. And it shows that Bitcoin has that growth potential. So once you cross, cross that threshold into the um, 100,000 range, I think it's going to first accelerate. So Bitcoin's growth trajectory is not going to be you know, growing at 1,000 every couple of days or dropping by 1,000, but you'll start to go up by 10,000 a day or drop by 10,000 a day. And this is the God candle. And after that, we'll start to see Omega candles, which are 100,000 increments daily. So post 100K, that's when things start to heat up and it starts to accelerate. You're further along that steep exponential growth curve. And now let's get to the potential catalyst that could uh, spark that sort of massive growth that you are talking about. Can you just briefly explain what hyper-Bitcoinization is and uh, why we may be near to that uh, scenario? We are very near hyper-Bitcoinization. So the definition hyper-Bitcoinization is a parallel of sorts to hyperinflation. It's the point at which we no longer need to convert Bitcoin back to fiat currencies like the dollar or yen simply because there's no need to. Everyone is using Bitcoin and most importantly, everyone only wants Bitcoin. So with money, it's typically a zero sum game. You don't really want an inferior money unless there's a, a direct need for it. Um, but generally people want to keep their savings or store value if they're using fiat currencies in the strongest vehicle of fiat currencies, which typically right now is the US dollar. But hyper-Bitcoinization will just be the point at which Bitcoin replaces the dollar and nobody wants to take the dollar anymore. They want sats for payment. And why do you think, uh, are we so close to that sort of scenario? Well, uh, there's a number of factors. The current legacy system is failing. If you look at the, uh, the fracturing of solidarity of the US dollar, you can see the BRICS countries are starting to migrate away. More trade is being done with the Chinese yen. And most importantly, you can see the U.S. debt is spiraling out of control. We are at $36 trillion right now. Back when your, your grandparents were, you know, going out to party, they were paying 15 cents for a hamburger. But now you're $36 trillion in debt. So there is a very big problem right now. And most people don't recognize the scale of that problem. But that debt is unlikely to be paid off. Even with a Doge or Department of Government Efficiency, there's only so much you can do to, to trim the fat and to uh, optimize and cost cut. But I think ultimately it's not going to have much effect because the spending is still there. And more importantly, the interest on that debt is compounding. And interest is a, a miracle. It's a miracle if you're you know, in, the, in the black, but it's uh, the opposite of a miracle <laughs> or it's a, a big curse when you're in the red. There is one company, MicroStrategy, which is sort of uh, uh, leading the path uh, on this. What is the significance of, of MicroStrategy in the process of uh, hyper -beaconization? Well, the, the biggest thing that uh, MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor is doing is that they are creating demand for Bitcoin. So I view the ETFs as a legitimization of Bitcoin as an asset class. And they are also a major source of demand. Um, demand for Bitcoin from the ETFs alone is multiples each day of supply. But MicroStrategy sort of adds gasoline on that fire by creating this Bitcoin reactor, which they can take uh, corporate debt, 
and uh, corporate equity and convert that to Bitcoin price a, a much higher multiple in the future and effectively pay zero interest rate for that. So there's sort of an accelerant on this, this fire that's already burning for Bitcoin. And it, I guess they are also sort of uh, giving an example to what nation states could do. They are running at a company level what certain nation states could do on a state level. Am I correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. But I believe the nation state path is also going to follow the same model, both as a reserve asset, but also is as a micro strategy type play. And I view the Bitcoin bonds that I helped to architect as this sort of micro strategy play for nation states. And we do see more and more interest coming back to Bitcoin bonds because it, it makes perfect sense to issue sovereign debt, which is superior in many ways to corporate debt, to acquire Bitcoin for a strategic reserve or to build a mining operation. Right now, I would say the um, nation state Bitcoin developments are very much centered on the US, especially with the election of uh, Trump once again. And the talk of creation of this Bitcoin strategic reserve in the US. So I think this is a catalyst for more change and more adoption of Bitcoin around the world, simply because most people are looking to follow somebody. They don't really want to be the first. El Salvador was the, the first nation state to really adopt Bitcoin in a meaningful way. But um, I think it's a small country and they're not. Um, being looked at as the, the, the meter stick to measure uh, and, and to decide what to do, much in the same way as the ETFs. So the ETFs, the U.S. kind of led the way there. Everyone was waiting for approval in the U.S. before they, they greenlit their own ETFs. And you saw that with the U.S. ETFs coming online and then the Hong Kong ones and then the Australian ones. They're very much watching and waiting. And I think it's the same for meaningful Bitcoin adoption, um, such as creation of a Bitcoin strategic reserve. But there's already talk at the state level of uh, a few states trying to create it before it's created at the federal level. And I believe this is also prompting more countries around the world to start really sitting down and trying to break down what they need to do and put together a plan. This idea of creating a strategic reserve is still pretty blurred. Trump uh, mentioned it during the conference back in the summer, but it was, he was just very generic in, in describing this. Then we had the Bitcoin Act pro proposed by Senator Loomis, which is uh, a bit more specific and it's about buying a certain amount of Bitcoin in a certain time frame um, and essentially hold it for the next, I believe, 20 years or something in order to cover a certain amount of uh, the national debt. What is your view? How that should look like? Well, it, it is... Um... Decently well defined, I think, in the bill, but at a high level, they 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 committed to stop selling any seized Bitcoin that they have, and there is a plan to purchase. Now, the details of that purchase execution is not really set, but I think that is um, not something that can be decided until once the bill has really been passed, and the timeline has also been more or less outlined. They want to create a reserve of 1 million Bitcoin. I think uh, Bobby Kennedy was talking about 4 million Bitcoin, but 1 million is still attainable, I think, for the US. Um, but it is going to be very expensive simply because of the micro strategy Bitcoin reactor uh, consuming so much Bitcoin fuel in the next few months with their deployment of $42 billion. So it remains to be seen at which price the US will buy at and what their average cost will be. But I just know that uh, things are definitely heating up and it, it seems like it, ha it will happen because it has to happen. And so what is your time frame for this? Uh, when do you expect this uh, bill to be passed into law? Well, I'm hopeful that it will be passed in the first 100 days because it is a very critical uh, piece of legislation and it is of time is of the essence simply because as more countries decide to front run the US, then you compound that with ETF demand and you compound that with uh, micro strategy demand and other corporations. And it just uh, becomes very likely that the, the price is going to be very expensive if they wait too long. So I definitely think it's better sooner than later. In case this plays out, as you said, next year we'll see 
a huge spike in uh, in bitcoin price because if uh, if they move on with this then we have other countries jumping in the appreciation we saw in 2024 would probably look very little compared to what we're going to see in 2025 yeah i think 2025 is going to be the year of the omega candle and the year of 1 million bitcoin now i have like just a couple of uh, concerns what would be the rationale for the us government to implement something like that because at the end of the day, the U.S. dollar at the moment is the global reserve currency. Trump has always been a staunch defender of the U.S. dollar dominance. And so why would he play against the U.S. dollar and accelerate its demise by accepting Bitcoin? Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, does Bitcoin prolong the life of the dollar or does it kill it? I think it can prolong the life of the dollar a little bit but ultimately all fiat currencies will fail and this is just because we will gravitate as a, a civilization to the hardest form of money and the best form of money so yes adoption of bitcoin and building a strategic bitcoin reserve does strengthen the position short term of the us and by extension the us dollar but uh Long term, it doesn't really matter. It's just maybe prolonging the life of uh, the dollar for another five years, maybe. But as the world moves to a Bitcoin standard, you simply just don't want a fiat currency. Just like today, if I offered you uh, payment for something in seashells, you'd be like, "No, I'll take um, I'll take see some fiat currency." You know, you you don't want the seashells as money. Maybe to de decorate your room, but not to uh, store value in for sure. The adoption of Bitcoin as a reserve currency in the U.S. could really uh, lead to a massive appreciation in this asset and uh, so to the enrichment of a relatively small amount of people who are like Bitcoin hodlers. Are you not afraid that this move would just uh, exacerbate uh, inequality? Well, inequality is a very difficult topic. The only way to make people equal is to seize assets from one group and pass them out to another group. And historically, that has not ended very well. So I think we have to accept that there will be an imbalance. I think that's a better word of uh, wealth distribution, uh, because much like any, um, any change in dynamics of society and technology, there's always a, a set of early adopters that benefit the most. But having uh, wealthy Bitcoiners is not, is not necessarily a bad thing, because I think um, Bitcoiners as a group would finance many things that are beneficial for society and for civilization. So it, it's just a question of where do you want the wealth to be uh, concentrated? Would it be the, the wealthy people that have printed money and can continue to print at an accelerating pace? Um, or a new set of people with a strong ethos for sound money and with a low time preference uh, and with a thinking to better the world. I think I would go with the latter. Now, just a final question regarding, um, regarding another benchmark that you were talking about lately. There could be a time when Bitcoin market cap will uh, equate the market cap of gold. And uh, you see this moment as a um, sort of milestone, which uh, will bring uh, immense uh, change. Why do you think that that benchmark, the equality of the Bitcoin market cap and the market, market cap of gold is so significant? Um, because Bitcoin and gold are very similar, both things are valuable because we ascribe value to them. Our understanding of gold is really, it's been valuable for a very long time, thousands of years. And now we have this thing called Bitcoin, which has grown up in just, uh, you know, 15 years. And it's uh, now seeming to be on the track to overtake gold. So I think at some point, the, the masses have to start to understand that there is a change coming. And I would say maybe it was the previous gold market cap or half the market cap of current, um, uh, of go current gold uh, market cap. So maybe about 400,000 per Bitcoin would be that threshold, I think. So that, let's call that the Veblen threshold. Once you cross that line, then I think people that hold gold are going to see like this thing that I'm watching in my rearview mirror is approaching very rapidly. 
do I still want to have these uh, bars of gold that I can't really easily verify or move? Or do I want this digital gold that's teleportable and verifiable by a Raspberry Pi? I think you start to question that at that 400,000 mark or a 0.4M mark. And then you start to have people selling gold and moving funds into Bitcoin. I guess we're going to see it next year. It sounds like we're going to see many exciting things happening and uh, a lot of uh, bold expectations. We're going to see how things will play out. Samson, it was a pleasure to have you on our show. Awesome. Thanks, Giovanni.